Jabonani. Jabonani. This sketch, called Shibonini, was published in 1855 by Lawrence Oliphant, former civil secretary and superintendent general of Indian Affairs in Canada. We are looking toward the west end of the channel. George Island is on the left side of the sketch. On the right, on the mainland, is De La Mirandier's trading post and part of the village of Shibonini. Ani and good day. My name is Adele Lusmore and I'm a Robinson Huron Treaty Indian from Shibonini. My community is at the entrance to the North Channel of Georgian Bay and I've placed a white dot on the map below me to show our location. This video is part two of the Métis Nation of Ontario's great racial conflict, the Killarney Métis against the white settlers. Let's see what happens next. Our First Nations ancestors are Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi. But the Métis Nation of Ontario and the province of Ontario decided to change their ethnic identity to Métis. They did this by distorting some parts of the historic record and ignoring other parts of it. This manipulation of our ethnic identity is deeply disrespectful to our ancestors and our community, and it violates the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. This series of videos was created to show you that their claims are not supported by the historic record. In 1894, PR wrote a letter to the Member of Parliament for Port Arthur, and he said, Dear Sir, last winter I received instructions from the Department of Marine to give all possible assistance to Mr. Elliot, F.O., meaning fisheries officer, Sault Ste. Marie, to enforce the fishery laws. And I think I did my duty, though an unpleasant one, faithfully, which I think Mr. Elliot can testify. And because I did so, all the fishermen of this place are against me, and I have been subjected to a terrible lot of trouble and to me, considerable loss during the past season. Then he goes on to list his damages and to ask the MP if he will support him in an application to the minister for compensation. Before I show you a list of the damages that PR is talking about, Let's take a look at the events that he described and the people that he says were involved. This is an image from the 1930s or the 1940s of Jackman's General Store at the east end of Channel Street. And in front of the store, is either Bill Godin or Eugene Godin driving an ox cart. The Godin family were farmers here for a number of years. Thomas Henry Jackman arrived here in the early 1880s as a school teacher, and he met Matilda Thibault. Her family ran a store here, and he married her and eventually took over that store, and it became T.H. Jackman's. The building 
still stands today, and even though it's changed somewhat in appearance, you would still recognize it as the one pictured in this photo. Today it's called Pitfield's General Store. Tommy Jackman and Charles Noble each owned a general store in Killarney, and they were the only general stores here. They were also both fish dealers. Charles Noble went to Jackman, and he wanted him to enter into an agreement not to sell PR anything at all out of their stores and not to allow PR to land any goods on their dock that he might get from other places and not to employ PR or any of his children to do any work. As PR saw it, Charles Noble wanted to starve out PR and his family. But Thomas Jackman refused to enter into that in agreement. And sometime later, Jackman did hire one of PR's sons for a few days to go and gather fish among the fishermen. And Charles Noble heard about it and was very angry. And, and apparently he went and confronted Jackman and according to PR, they had a few hot words about it. This is a view of the west end of the Killarney Channel around 1902, probably looking pretty much the same as it did in 1893 when the fishery troubles were happening. Behind those little fishing sailboats on the right hand side, is the Killarney Hotel. It was destroyed by fire in 1903 and it was rebuilt and back in operation the same year. Years later the hotel on that location would come to be called the Sportsman's Inn. William Solomon went to talk to PR about what was going on. He told PR that Charles Noble had been busy taking up a collection to raise $50 to put PR into trouble. That Charles had put up $10 and so had his brother James. And that T.H. Jackman, Basil Patton and Dominic Russo had all given him money as well. Then Charles Noble went to Dominic Solomon and told him he wanted money from him, but Solomon refused. PR said he was told later that Mr. Jackman had not given any money to Charles Noble. Dominic Russo probably did not contribute to that fund either because in a different letter, PR writes that Dominic came to see him and that he was very upset that there were other light keepers who were not enforcing the fishery rules and that he complained bitterly that the fish were not being protected at Bing Inlet and that he could see a large decrease in the pickerel and the bass. Here's another view of the village from the channel. This photo was taken from the deck of the steamer Atlantic in June of 1899, about five years after this fisheries fight happened. And on the right, you can see one of those little fishing sailboats at a dock. Its sails aren't up, and it looks like a couple more on the shore. Back to the story. 
Joe, Lagasse had something to tell PR. I don't know how the Lagasse family fits in with our families, if at all. Anyway, it says in the fisheries file that this man spoke to PR. And he said he had overheard James Noble talking to William Labatt and telling him that J and C Noble would do all they could against the overseer, the fishery constable, and PR, and that they would put every one of them out of their government position. That they had lots of money and they would give PR all the trouble possible. Charles Noble and his supporters did make trouble for PR. So much trouble that the Deputy Minister of Marine and Fisheries wrote to Arthur Sherwood, the Commissioner of the Dominion Police, and asked him to send a constable to Killarney to protect PR. The Dominion Police had been formed in 1868 and their duty at that time was to protect the federal buildings in Ottawa, but as time went on, additional duties were assigned. Eventually, they joined with the Northwest Mounted Police, and the new police force was called the Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Commissioner Sherwood asked a constable to go to Killarney, and a few days later, the constable wrote to him, reporting on his trip. He said, I left Ottawa Tuesday night by CPR and arrived at Massey Station Wednesday at 4 p.m. Massey Station is the place where the mail is taken off the train to go to Little Current and Killarney. The boats are not running now, and the ice is not strong enough for horse travelling, and there is no land road. The only means of getting from Massey to Killarney at present is to travel on foot through the woods and on the shores of Spanish River, until the ice is strong enough to carry horses, which will be sometime in January. Finding I could not get through, I returned to Ottawa arriving at 6.30 a.m. Friday. The distance from Massey Station to Killarney is about 50 miles. So let's take a look at some of the damages that PR talks about. Twice the underwear of his wife and daughters was stolen from the clothesline. The first time someone apparently put the underwear on and was dancing around in it. And the second time, someone put underwear up a flagpole on Round Island. So this particular incident is more like just a silly prank, but of course, it didn't stay at that level. Things got worse from there. During the night, shots were fired around his house and firewood was thrown onto the roof. And then the neighbors will not speak to them anymore. The children's friends make unpleasant remarks to them. People won't hire PR's sons and there are threats of bodily harm. Finally, the bellows in his blacksmith shop was slit. Seven tons of his hay was set on fire and destroyed. One of his cows was poisoned. And one of his horses, his driving mare, was shot and wounded. At some point, I'm not sure when, six people were charged with trespassing and they had to go to Sault Ste. Marie for the trial. 
Two of the people were convicted, and they went to jail in Sault Ste. Marie for a month, I believe. But the file doesn't name who the six people were. So you can see from all of this information why PR was asking for a constable and why he says in his letters to the ministry that he and his family are living in dread. They don't know what's going to happen next. This picture shows part of Channel Street with our church in the center of it. It was called St. Joseph's Church and it was built in 1885. On the left side of the church is the rectory and on the right side is Tom Bateman's home. For many years, Killarney was a mission run by the Jesuits. They were stationed at Holy Cross Mission at Wequemecong on Manitoulin Island but one of the missionaries would be assigned to Killarney and he might be here for a couple of years and then he would go back to headquarters and a different Jesuit would come. And at the time these fishery troubles were going on, Father Paquin came to CPR about it. He asked him if he could see the written instructions that PR had received from the department. And after looking over the instructions and the correspondence PR had with the ministry, he decided that he would support PR in what he was doing. At first, PR said, Father Pankin was on the verge of condemning him, but once he saw the paperwork and understood what was going on, he had decided that he would defend PR against anyone who had anything to say about the duties he was expected to perform. If Father Paquin needed convincing about the instructions given to PR by the Department of Marine and Fisheries, then it's no surprise that the commercial fishermen did not accept the lighthouse keeper's new and unusual practice of reporting fishing violations. It appears that Charles and James Noble did their best to keep everyone angry and defiant. The violence that resulted was likely the work of one or two people who took matters to extremes not the whole group of fishermen. The next fishing season began with a crackdown on those who violated the fishery regulations. In May of 1894, the Department of Marine and Fisheries came in and seized the four fishing tugs belonging to Jane C. Noble, as well as some other boats and equipment. In a report to the Privy Council, the Minister of Marine and Fisheries said that the nobles had been guilty of frequent violations of the Fisheries Act and regulations and that they aided and abetted others in similar violations. The nobles fought back and said they had been unfairly treated and eventually there was a commissioner appointed to look into the case and he found that they had been unfairly treated and the fight went on and it ended up a political hot potato being discussed in the House of Commons. But as far as what happened in Killarney, when the department came in and laid all those charges, that is what ended the violence in this fight. PR wrote to the department in July of 1894 and he said 
although the feeling of the fishermen of this place is still strong against me i do not think they will trouble me any more the refusal of fishing licenses and the seizure of some of their boats has been a terrible blow to them and he said i hear that they have decided to quietly submit and follow the fishing regulations in the future the metis nation of ontario claims that these events are all about harassment and racism directed towards a metis man pr by the white settlers and that the Killarney Métis banded together to protect PR and his family. So let's take a look at who was for PR and who was against him. On the list of people for him are two native fishermen, one native hunter, one non-native merchant and one non-native Jesuit missionary. So the two native fishermen are Dominic Rousseau and Dominic Solomon. The native hunter is William Solomon. The merchant is Thomas Jackman and the Jesuit missionary is Father Pucke. According to PR, the people against him included all the commercial fishermen, except two, former friends, and the neighbors. I don't know how many commercial fishermen there were in Killarney in 1893, but the number probably was not very different from the number that is found on the 1891 census from two years earlier. On that census, there are 25 native fishermen and 12 non-native fishermen. So the majority of the fishermen that were against PR were native. And if we leave out the two fishermen who went to PR with information. That means 35 fishermen were against him, along with former friends and the neighbors. And what about the wives and the children and the brothers and sisters of these commercial fishermen? Whose side are they likely to be on in this situation? So I think it's pretty obvious that there was no racial conflict here when it comes to this particular series of events surrounding the fisheries. It was not a case of the white settlers versus the Killarney Métis. It was the entire community versus the lighthouse keeper. Here's a list of the claims made by MNO in their YouTube video, none of which stand up to scrutiny. The only thing in their video that I haven't talked about is a series of events that once again involve Pierre de la Mirandière and a dispute he got into which led to big trouble with Indian affairs. I'll be talking about that in a later video. That last item on the list, that the Killarney Métis began hiding due to the racism directed toward them in the 1890s conflict, as we have just seen, that racial conflict didn't even happen. But if you believe that it did happen, then I guess you're going to also have to believe that in order to avoid the racism directed toward Métis people, our ancestors disguised themselves as Indians. And I say that because when it comes to my community, 
the historic record is all about being Indians. And you will see that if you keep watching my videos. As I mentioned before, the Métis Nation of Ontario has a membership register that contains the data they used to declare that certain people were Métis ancestors. So in the next video, let's take a closer look at the evidence Emino used to create the historic Métis community of Killarney.